Redeemer Queens Park exists to connect Jesus to people, people to community, and community to mission, and we are a spiritual family. People relying on each other and doing life together. We're marked by distinct values and rhythms, and we just got finished doing a collection of talks looking at Redeemer's vision and values. Next week, we're going to begin an Advent series where we're looking at some ideas around the coming of Jesus, our Savior, as we head into the, into the Christmas weekend. But you started it last week and we're in it today again. We're spending a couple weeks focusing on life together as members of one another. The Redeemer community, a spiritual family, as members of one another. Thomas started it last week looking at what, is it, what it means to bear one another's burdens. And, and first we have to be rooted in the gospel to be able to bear one another's burdens. And today we're going to be in Colossians chapter 3 and we're going to look at a talk entitled Everyone Fully Mature. And, and the, the baseline understanding here is to bear one another's burdens and for all of us to grow together into full spiritual maturity. The baseline New Testament truth is we're a spiritual family. We are a spiritual family. And whether, whether that seems like a deep theological truth to you or not, I don't know, but the reality is it's all over the pages of the New Testament, and we find it clearly through the epistles that Paul writes. We are a spiritual family. We're brothers and sisters marked by distinct values. We're, we're marked by a distinct spirit that's in one, of an, in, in one another. Mark chapter 3 says, you and I, as members of this spiritual family, are brothers and sisters. We're united under the fatherly care of the same godly father. From Ephesians 2, we have a diversity of family members, fathers, mothers, brothers and sisters, all in the spiritual family. From 1 Timothy chapter 5, we are a spiritual family. Hebrews 2, 11 tells us, the one who makes men holy, that's Jesus, and those who are made holy, that's you and that's me, we're all in the same family. Jesus, our big brother, God the Father, and all of us, spiritual brothers and sisters, in the same spiritual family. And again, it's all over the pages of the New Testament. It's a deep theological truth that we're looking at today. We're gonna to look at what does it mean to be spiritual family to one another? Joseph Hellerman wrote a book a few years ago that's called When the Church Was Family. And he coined this term called familified, familified. And he defined it as this. It's the once and for all act that takes place at conversion when the believer is positionally joined to a new spiritual family of brothers and sisters in the local church. We've been familified. We've been positionally joined together as brothers and sisters in the local church. However, it becomes blurry because of the air we breathe and the, the culture that we're living in, this, this Western uh, secular society that we're living in. It's so focused on the individual, what our rights and what our needs are for ourselves. And you and I have been conditioned to think that way. We worry about who am I gonna marry? What am I gonna do on Friday night? And what vocation and am I gonna go into? And while none of these are wrong necessarily in and of themselves, we're just so conditioned to think about ourselves. So often I'm worried about what's coming up for me and what do I want? And it distracts us from being familified, joined to a spiritual family, a current present reality. Hellerman goes on to say, after we are familiified, the status of family members, we should long to increasingly actualize our positional reality of familification as we grow in the image and likeness of Jesus. So just like sanctification, where when we're saved by Jesus, we enter in relationship with Jesus, we are positionally set apart as holy people, God's holy people, Yet we grow into that reality through the process of sanctification over a lifetime. We become, in reality, more holy people. But positional and then practical, we grow into it. The same is true as a spiritual family. 
we've been positionally set apart as a spiritual family. And now, Redeemer, we get the chance to grow into that reality. And today is going to be a big part of it. Galatians 6 was a step. And today, Colossians 3 is going to be another step in that process. So let's look at the text. Colossians. In chapter 1, the Apostle Paul writes this letter to the saints in Colossae, and he encourages them with the supremacy of Jesus. In chapter 1, and then he goes on to say how that has implications on the life of the Christian. In chapter 1, verse 28, Paul writes that he and Timothy are writing this letter so that they might present everyone fully mature in Jesus. That's their purpose. And today, we're going to look, what does it mean to be a spiritual family where everyone can be presented fully matured in Jesus? Chapters 2 and 3 then go on, and they appeal for a pathway of Christian maturity. And it's going to be, after this introduction, no surprise to you that in chapter 3, Paul says the pathway to Christian maturity is through the local church spiritual family. Paul starts this section, verses 12 through 17 of chapter 3, he starts it by naming that the church is a massive gift of grace from God. Verse number 12 says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, we're chosen by God, we're loved by God, and we've been set apart as His holy people. We're chosen by God as a gift of grace. Once we were His enemies, at enmity with Him, and in His kindness, undeserved by us, He's chosen us as His people. We're loved by God. Even though we didn't love Him, He, in an act of grace, has chosen to love us. He's set us apart as His special possessions. Again, even though we were running from God at one point in His grace, He's chosen to set us apart as His holy people. God saved us into a spiritual family as an act of grace. And now, He's going to use this spiritual family as an act of grace in our lives to grow us all up into maturity. So Redeemer, for the rest of this talk, let's look at two ways in which the text tells us that there's pathways to grow into full spiritual maturity as a family as we live as members of one another. So as a spiritual community, as a spiritual family, trying to grow so that we all reach full maturity, the first big idea from the text is that we are given new clothes as a spiritual family. It comes from verses 12 through 14. Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Guys, we all know those cringe-worthy family photos where we look at the parents who have 17 kids and they're all dressed on the beach for the family photo in the exact same thing. The reality is, as a spiritual family, we have squad uniforms as well, but they are beautiful. We see them in verse 12. We have these squad unis marked by distinct fashion statements because Jesus is the one who ultimately wore these same garments. Look, we've been given compassion. We put on a deep sensitivity to the needs and sorrows of others. We put on kindness, a tender and comparing spirit towards one another. We put on humility, a disposition ready to forgo our own rights for the sake of others. We put on gentleness, a soft and meek spirit to approach one another. And we put on patience, a disposition steadily in continued fellowship with one another, able to persevere with one another. Putting on these squad unis then allows us to accomplish the two imperatives that we see in verse 13. The first big one 
is bear with one another in relationships with odd and difficult people or even with generally easy people to get along with we still have to persevere knowing that it allows them to fully be themselves without us taking offense at them we we don't have to think after an offhanded comment by a brother or sister well i wonder if he actually meant something by that no no we bear with one another by either going to them and asking them in grace and gentleness and humility or we just let it slide off assuming the best about our brother and sister it takes those five garments that we put on to be able to bear with one another we also are told to forgive one another in verse 13 whether an actual offense or a rumor of an offense we we don't hold on to our right to maintain that burden and hold it against a friend or a brother or sister we actually lay our right down to hold that grievance against them just as jesus laid down his right to hold our sins against us he even laid down his life so that he didn't hold anything against us consider what dr john perkins said an american civil rights leader who was abused and humiliated and beaten in a mississippi jail cell after that jail cell incident he came to understand the truth of what it means to bear with one another and forgive one another here's what he said the spirit of god worked on me as i lay in that bed an image formed in my mind the image of the cross christ on the cross it blotted out everything else in my mind this jesus knew what i had suffered he understood and he cared because he had experienced it all himself this jesus this one who had brought good news directly from God in heaven, had lived what he preached, yet he was arrested and falsely accused. Like me, he went through the unjust trial. He also faced a lynch mob and got beaten. But even more than that, he was nailed to a wooden plank and killed, killed like a common criminal. At the crucial moment, it seemed Jesus, uh, it seemed to Jesus that even God himself had deserted him. The suffering was so great, he cried in agony, he was dying. But when he looked at the mob that had lynched him, he didn't hate them, he loved them, he forgave them. And he prayed to God to forgive them. Father, forgive these people, they don't know what they're doing. His, his enemies hated, but Jesus forgave. And Dr. Perkins says, I couldn't get away from that. The Spirit of God kept working on me in that jail cell until I could say with Jesus, I forgive them too. I promised him that I would return good to evil, not evil for good. And he gave me the love I knew I would need to fulfill his command to me, love your enemy. And because of Christ, God himself met me and healed my heart and mind, and he gave me love. Guys, verse 13 leading into 14 says, the only way we can bear with one another, the only way we can fully love each other and forgive each other as Jesus has done is if we put on love. It gives us this image of all these other garments of gentleness and patience and humility that are, that are put on, but they're cumbersome and, and they're a little awkward as the wind blows. And it's only by putting on this belt of love that it binds all together and it fits properly and, and we can go about our day and do the things that we're tasked to do because we put on love. Most of us will never be offended like John Perkins was offended. We know no one will ever take on the offense and the sins that Jesus took on. And yet, like Dr. Perkins, we can look to Jesus and follow his example because we know we've been forgiven, we can bear with one another, and we can forgive one another. This is, this is life together. This is members of one another putting on these family clothings so that we can all grow into maturity. Redeemer family, not only have we been given clothes to put on for all of us to become fully mature together, but our spiritual family has also 
we've been given accountability to one another. That's that's the cash out idea of this, enti of this entire talk. As a spiritual family, we are accountable to and for one another. So first we see in the first part of verse 16 that we're accountable to one, to one another as the gospel lives among us. He says, let the good news of Jesus dwell richly among you. It's, it's this idea that it's not it's not only a message, although it is a message, it's good news and it's active in our lives. I, I get this image of, of a hot potato where we've all got this spud and we're bouncing it around from me to you to the next person to the next person and back around in the same way. The gospel dwells richly among us. It's alive in us as we're accountable to one another to remind each other of the gospel and give each other the good news of the gospel when we're down and for you to give me the good news of the gospel when I'm down. We're accountable to one another. We've been entrusted with this good news, the message of the gospel, to be able to speak it to one another so that we can all grow into maturity. I need it. You need it as a spiritual family. We need it. It can dwell richly among us. The next thing we see from verse 16 is that we're accountable to teach one another, not just the pastoral staff in Colossae, but the, the every saint from the most mature to the least mature, the person who's, who thinks they're most seated, suited to teach, and the person who thinks they're just starting to try to figure it out. We're all accountable to teach one another. This means that Paul's mission, everyone being fully mature, is only accomplished if everyone is teaching one another. So when you're on your next community group call, when, when it sounds a little confusing and, and you're just trying to be silent and hang in the background, Redeemer is a spiritual family where we need you to speak up. What's on your heart, what you understand, say it and say it again and say it again. The least mature to the person who would consider themselves the most mature. Redeemer is a family where we're accountable to teach one another. That's the only way that we're all gonna grow into full maturity. And next, we're accountable to admonish one another. That's in verse 16 as well. Admonishing one another entails both warning and correction. So when you see my life and it's not aligned with the gospel in some area, then the New Testament expectation is that you come to me and you tell me, hey Daniel, Here's a correction, here's a warning, you're not aligned to the gospel. And the same is true for me to you. We're all gonna grow into spiritual maturity if we're all quick to admonish each other. It, yes, it takes gentleness. Yes, it takes humility, those clothes that we put on from the first part of the text. But it's only gonna happen if we all do it together. If, if we find out that a brother or sister is struggling or their life isn't aligned to the truth of the gospel, there should be this meek, and humble race to their house to caringly bring that brother or sister back in through admonishing. We're accountable to one another as we're members of one another. Interestingly here, Paul says that we teach and we admonish by song and by him, by songs in the spirit. As we grow as members of one another and as we take the truth of our spiritual family seriously, then the, the everyday life of corporate worship and corporate gathering becomes even more weighty. So when, when I know that a brother is struggling with guilt and, and believing that he's truly forgiven, I can say to him, hey brother, last week I heard you singing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. You need to believe that today, man. If, if I'm struggling to trust that the work that I'm trying to do for the gospel, I don't know if it's ever gonna bear any fruit, then one of my community group members can come to me and they, say, they can say, Daniel, no man, last week I heard you reading from uh, Ephesians 2 verse 10, where God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God has prepared in advance for us. Daniel, you need to believe that today, man. I need you to come say that to me. When, when we know that a sister is down, she's struggling with anxiety or depression, the spiritual family, members of one another, accountable to each other, needs to say, hey, we read Psalm 42.5 on the pastoral prayer call on Monday. Sister, remember it. It says, why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you at turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation to my God. We need a whole family of people 
going to each other, to teach each other, to admonish each other, and remind each other of the gospel. This is for everyone, and we're accountable to one another. We teach one another gospel truth, we admonish one another in gospel living, so that this whole family can grow into full maturity. Guys, since lockdown, my family of five has been going on bike rides, and, uh, and we go around the Northwest, nothing too, uh, too adventurous. But the big idea is we try to stay in a line, we try to stay nice and thin so that we can go down pavements and, and the edges of roads. But one of the kids may try to pass another one and, and we get unstable and, and we have some tension. I'm anxious from the time we leave the house until the time we get back to it. And when it's safe, I always stop the family and I say to the kids, guys, this ride is only successful if all five of us make it back home safely. It doesn't matter if you finish and get back home 15 seconds ahead of your brother and sister. This ride is only successful if all five of us get back home safely. So it, uh, it takes on uh, a meaning that we're in it together. We're all accountable to each other. If one of us falls or if one of us gets a flat tire or if one of us is struggling getting up the hill, we're accountable to one another to get home safely. So I can look at Hannah and I can say, Hannah, you're doing great. I actually think you could pick the speed up a little bit. Keep your eyes ahead. Remember the basics. You can go a little faster. I can look at Eli. Eli, right now is not the time to try to be passing your brother. Why don't you just slow down and fall into a steady pace? Remember the basics, man. And David, David, don't look around behind you. Don't take one hand off the handlebars. Remember the basic. Keep your, eye, keep your eyes ahead. Keep two hands on the handlebar. Don't try to pass your brother right now. We're all going to make it home safely. Paige, you look awesome. Keep pedaling, girl. Like, it's going great. She can yell at me, Daniel, we need to slow down right now. Everybody needs a little break. It's only successful if we all make it home safely. And in the same way, for our church family, we're healthy, we're healthy and we are fulfilling our purpose as a church family when everyone is growing up into maturity. We're all accountable to one another to get there. We teach one another, we admonish one, one another, we submit ourselves to being taught and admonished by one another. And it's the same as riding. The way we do, with the way we make it home on a family bike ride is remembering the basics. Keep your hands on the handlebars and look straight ahead. And it's the same in the Christian life. We remember the basics so that we can all get to full maturity. Verse 17 sums it up and says, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. To do everything in the name of Jesus simply means we represent Him in all we do, and He's the empowerment for all we do. So our brother Jesus persevered with the people that He was around so that we can persevere with our spiritual family as well. Jesus humbly taught the truth to the people He was around to bring them to spiritual maturity, you and I then, and speak the truth to our spiritual family and bring them to full maturity. Jesus admonished his friends that they could grow. And the same is true for you and me as we are members together. Redeemer, we're already a spiritual family. We've been familified. Let's continue to grow into the reality that's already true about us. We're members together and we're accountable to one another. Let's grow as a spiritual family.